Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, October 9th, 2022. This is Deacon Barry Taylor. We are still in Unit 2 for the Fall Quarter, which is entitled Out of Slavery to Nationhood. Out of Slavery to Nationhood. We are in Lesson 6 today, and from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, our lesson title is expressing thankfulness expressing thankfulness our devotional reading is taken from exodus chapter 14 verses 21 to 31 background scripture taken from deuteronomy chapter 31 verses 30 to chapter 32 verses 47 and our printed passage or lesson text is taken from deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 3 to 6 verses 10 to 14 and then verse 18 our key verse is not in the printed passages in the background scripture it is Deuteronomy 32 verse 46 and from the King James Version it reads he said unto them set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day which ye shall command your children to observe, to do all the words of this law. Again, that's Deuteronomy 32, 46. Lesson aims from the quarterly or number one, examine the Israelites' responses to God's faithful care and love. Number two, remember times when you felt ungrateful and or experienced ingratitude from others. And then number three, express gratitude daily. That is gratitude to God and for all that he has done for us daily. Our lesson after the introduction has three divisions. The first is entitled, Forgetting to Remember. Forgetting to Remember. And that's covered between Deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 3 to 6. And the second is entitled, Disregarding God's Grace. And that's covered between Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 10 to 14 and verse 18. I will give a few uh, introductory remarks and try to uh, set our lesson in context. Uh, and then we will read each uh, division and then uh, back up and have some verse-by-verse -verse discussion of uh, each division. Um, we'll say some words about the uh, introduction, which I think uh, the quarterly commentator did a great job on. Uh, before that, let's go before the throne. Father, we do thank and praise you for yet another opportunity to study your precious word. Lord, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Lord, we thank you for uh, using Moses, Lord, to reveal uh, your character, more of your character and your faithfulness and your love uh, to your chosen people, Lord. And certainly uh, to those of us who have placed our trust in the Lord Jesus. We are indeed your people as well, Lord, under the new covenant. Lord, we thank you for revealing to us, Lord, our fickleness and our sinfulness in contrast to your steadfastness. And Lord, I pray that we would learn from this lesson, Lord, which is an historical narrative, uh, how to be uh, more thankful, Lord, how to be, uh, to express our gratitude, Lord, to you, and, uh, and certainly uh, with the praise of our lips, Lord, but in tangible ways as well, uh, living more faithfully before you day by day, Lord. We just thank you again for uh, this opportunity. We pray that you give us a clear understanding of your word, Lord. And again, help us to, uh, to live more faithfully before you as a result of a greater understanding of your, your character and your great love and your steadfastness uh, in uh, meeting all of our needs, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, if you read the background scripture, you read... In, ver in chapter 31 where um, God had instructed Moses 
to write a song uh, for the children that were poised to enter the land of Canaan, the promised land. These were the children of those who the Lord brought out of Egypt uh, with his mighty works and his mighty power some 40 years earlier. Uh, the book title entitled Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means second law, uh, or that is a second giving or repetition of the law. This was the law given initially at Mount Sinai to the parents of the children uh, that came uh, to the parents that came out of Egypt of these children now that are about to go into Canaan to possess the land. Now, as you know, they, because of their lack of faith, uh, after the 12 spies went and spied out the land, the majority of them uh, didn't think that God could bring them into the land and that they uh, would be killed, their children would be taken, their wives would be raised, raped and so forth. And so the Lord turned them back into the land and they wandered for 40 years until all those 21 years, uh, no older, uh, uh, perished in the wilderness. Now, uh, so Moses takes the time to go through uh, all of the law that was presented to the parents. And I'm going to just briefly read uh, portions of the context here, and then we'll get back to uh, the Lord's instruction to Moses to write this song. And, and, and let me just say, uh, songs uh, help us to remember things. I remember when I was a teenager and loving certain R&B songs, and I mean, I could memorize the, the, uh, the verses of every song on an LP. And, it, it, and once you, uh, you remember the verses and you hear the tune, it just everything just comes back. So uh, God intended for what he instructed Moses to give to the children of Israel as a song to remind them of the words of the, exactly what was said in the song. Now, the biblical context from the quarterly says the meaning of the word Deuteronomy, again, is second law. It is a second giving or repetition of the law. The book is a narration of Moses' review of the original commands of God given at Sinai to the first generation of Israel, of Israelites who left Egypt but died in the wilderness. Moses spoke his final message to the new generation of Israelites poised to enter the promised land. Written as a treaty between the king and his subject, or as a treaty, Moses' message admonished or warned the new generation to remember who God is and what he has done. That is something we see repeatedly over and over throughout the Old Testament. Moses did not want God's people to repeat the tragic mistakes of their ancestors, particularly their, most immediately, their parents who because of their lack of faith, died in the wilderness, never uh, realizing the promise or receiving the promise uh, by entering the promised land. The ancestors lack faith, or lacks the ancestors' lack of faith rather condemned them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years and die in the desert. Deuteronomy is more than a review of the law. It is a set of instructions explaining what the Israelites must do to conquer and possess their inheritance and live successfully, as to say successfully, in the land that God promised. Moses called for complete devotion to Yahweh, Israel's God, and sound choices based on Israel's knowledge of him. Moses changed the form of his instruction from lecture to lyric in Deuteronomy 32, the Song of Moses. The purposes of the song were to, one, review the nation's history. That is what God had done in forming them and what he'd done in delivering them from bondage and keeping them in the wilderness. Number two, identify their past mistakes and warn against repeating them. And then number three, to remind all who heard him that God rewards obedience. The lesson context text contrasts God's character and goodness with the people's rebellion, rebellious, ungrateful attitude. It contrasts, I will add, his 
steadfastness uh, with the children of Israel's fickleness. We'll say more about that as we get further into the lesson. So let's jump right in. The Again, the first division is entitled Forgetting to Remember. And that's covered again between verse chapter 32, verses 3 to 6. But before we do that, let's go back to 31, where God instructed Moses to write this psalm and give the children of Israel this psalm. So let's go back to 31. Let's begin at uh, verse 16. From the NI, from sorry, for the new King, from the New King James Version, it reads, "And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers, and this people will rise and play the harlot with the gods of the foreigners of the land where they go to be among them, and they will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them." Verse 17. Then my anger shall be aroused against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured. And many e evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Have not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face that day, because of all the evil which they have done in that they have turned to other gods. And verse 19 reads, Now therefore, write down this song for yourself and teach it to the children of Israel. Put in their mouths, put it rather in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. That this song may be a witness and a contrast between, I'm, I'm adding this, my faithfulness and my steadfastness and their wickedness and their fickleness. Uh, and then it goes on to say in verse 20, When I have brought them to the land flowing with milk and honey, of which I swore to their fathers, and they have eaten and filled themselves uh, and grown fat, then they will turn to other gods and serve them, and they will provoke me and break, and break my covenant. Then it shall be, when many evils and troubles have come upon them, that this song will testify against them as a witness, for it will not be forgotten in the mouths of their descendants, for I know the inclination of their behavior today, even before I have brought them into the land of which I swore to give them. So God gives Moses this song to give to the children. And of course, they were to teach it to their children. Moses was to teach it to them. They were to teach it to their descendants. And when they sung this song, they would be reminded of God's goodness, of his faithfulness, and they would be reminded of the evil that God is telling Moses they are going to commit. And, and even the evil that he's revealing, even the evil that's in their hearts before he even brings them into the land. So with that, let's read our first passage uh, from the first division, again, which is entitled Forgetting to Remember. And I'm going to read from the NIV, beginning at verse 3, verses 3 to 6. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. Verse 5. They are corrupt and not his children. To their shame they are a warped and crooked generation. Is this the way you repay the Lord, you foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father, your creator, who made you and formed you? Now, I think we could add a little clarity to that passage. We're going to come back to it in just a minute. If we read the first couple of verses uh, of that chapter, it kind of sets up uh, verse 3. So Moses Re, uh, says rather in verse 1 give ear O heaven 
and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teachings drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as the raindrops on the tender herbs, and as the showers on the grass. So Moses is asking the heaven and the earth to be his witnesses of what he is about to say, of what he is about to teach the children of Israel in this song. And he wants it to be as pervasive, what he's saying, as rain and dew on the on the, the ground and on the plants. So again, let's let's go back now to verse three of our first passage, which again from the NIV reads, So I will proclaim the name of the Lord. O oh, praise the greatness of our God. So proclaiming or as the King James uh, reads, publishing the name of the Lord is speaking of his character. The name uh, of God reflects his very nature. Uh, we know that God pronounces uh, uh, many names that he has, which again all speak of his character. And he also says he will proclaim his greatness, and that is his greatness as demonstrated by his omnipotence, by his almighty power and of course in delivering uh, the generation that he brought out of Egypt along with some of these children uh, where it may have been old enough uh, to uh, have witnessed some of this but were not again 21 or older uh, at the time uh, he turned them back into the wilderness and he goes on in verse 4 to say he is the rock his works are perfect and all his ways are just, a faithful God who does not, who does rather, no wrong, upright and just is he. Okay, he is again uh, speaking of the, the great, the character of God. When he mentions rock, when he said he is the rock, uh, Rock speaks of uh, his immutability, his unchangingness, his stability. Uh, he is an anchor. Uh, it speaks of all of that. He is uh, steadfast. Verse uh, 15, we get to verse uh, 15 and 32. It says he, he, is, he is the savior and ruler of his people. Uh, and we'll say more about about that he is a rock of our salvation we know that uh, uh, he is likened unto a rock throughout the old testament as well as the new testament he is the firm foundation uh and and so this rock speaks of again his his un, his unchangingness his stability and his uh being a firm uh foundation on which we can we can build, we can stand, we can build our lives. Now, when it speaks of him being perfect, it says his works are perfect. And when we speak of that concerning humans, when we use this word perfect, we mean uh, mature uh, or complete insofar as we can be. But in this context, it literally means perfection. His works are perfect in every way. It says, and all his ways are just. That means righteous. They are right, all his ways are correct and right. A faithful God, he is faithful to us, even though we have not been faithful to him always. And of course, his chosen people, Israel, had not always been faithful to him. He says he does no wrong. He is upright, he is circumspect and just in everything that he does. Now. This is speaking of God's character. These first couple of verses speak of God's character. Now, they're going to be contrasted to the character of Israel, which will be revealed more fully once they enter into the land and they've uh, eaten the fat of the land. They've gotten fat. They've uh, enjoyed the, uh, the milk and the honey, uh, the oil and the, and the blood of grapes, as we'll see in a minute. Um, uh, they're going to reflect the character that he begins describing in verse 5. Verse 5 reads, 
they are corrupt and not his children. To their shame, they are a warped or perverted or twisted and crooked generation. That is nation. Uh, the generation doesn't mean just a particular uh, uh, a generation as we speak of it, uh, but it means a people or a nation. And verse, so we're talking about the children, first of all, and then we're going to say more about his fatherhood of them. They are not conducting themselves as his children. So he is basically saying they are not his children when in fact he did uh, form them. He actually, pro he, he was responsible for them becoming a nation. Uh, he brought them out of the world and formed them. So he is their father. But in this uh, and when they uh, become corrupt, they don't reflect him. And so therefore he is looking at them as if they are not his children. And he says to their shame, they become twisted. They become crooked, a crooked and twisted generation. More to say about that to come. Verse six says, is this the way you repay the Lord? And Lord is all caps, Jehovah, the self-existent one. You foolish and unwise people. Now they're singing this now, and this is bringing the contrast between the goodness of God and their crookedness and evilness uh, to, to their remembrance every time they do. He says, you foolish and unwise people. Is he not your father? Again, so he said just in the last verse, they were not his children, but now he says, is he not really in fact your father, your creator? The one who made you and formed you. He made them a nation. He formed them as a nation and a chosen generation or a nation of people. So what? Let, let's just uh, stick a pen in this verse for a minute. What, what makes them foolish? Well, uh, one of the things is the fact that they've disregarded the faithfulness of God or the goodness of God. And when they did that and when we do that, uh, we uh, we actually shift uh, the glory of God, or, or we uh, we don't uh, give God the credit uh, for the good in our lives, and which means that we, uh, we 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 believe ourselves somehow or some other uh, entity to be responsible for uh, the blessings that we're blessed. So we so we take we we really discredit God. When we don't, rip, when we disregard his faithfulness and his goodness and his blessings to us, as did ancient Israel, when when they then and when we now uh, show ingratitude or express ingratitude to God, uh, we are uh, forgetting to acknowledge him or failing to acknowledge him again as the source of everything even our existence uh, and so Moses uh, gives this this stanza again as a wake-up call for them uh, as well as us you know and all generations of believers and just just a, another word on this we uh, we can liken this in a in a small way to our showing and gratitude to our parents uh, not recognizing the love and care uh, uh, that they uh, showed us uh, during our rearing, uh, our raising up, getting grown and independent, and then disregarding them, uh, not requiting them as uh, we are instructed to do in the Bible, but pronouncing whatever we have as Corbin, if you're familiar with the New Testament and what Jesus spoke about that. Uh, so uh, this, again, in gratitude, removes the uh, the God as the source of our blessings, and makes uh, and and really gives us or some other entity the credit for the blessing that God is responsible for. Well, let's move in. There's a question here, uh, which is: In what ways, if any, has material prosperity led to attitudes? 
of ingratitude among believers. Can success cause a believer to dishonor God and damage his or her witness? Explain. Well, I think uh, we all know that from our human experience, uh, there is a there's a tendency uh, to when we are uh, well healed, if you will, uh, when we uh, we have a little money and we have a comfortable place to live, we have food and uh, and we're not lacking for anything, at least materially. Uh, there is uh, less tendency to uh, to give God uh, the credit for that which we have. Uh, that's human nature. Of course, we believers should recognize God as the source of every good and perfect gift. Uh, and sometimes it is better, uh, one of the commentators says, I also uh, use the standard commentary. Uh, one of the commentators said to be uh, in need than it is to have all of our needs provided for us. Because when we are in need, we certainly uh, know uh, when we can't meet those needs, we need to reach out to someone who can, and that, of course, is God. So let's move into um, our second passage, our division, which is entitled Disregarding God's Grace. And that's covered between Deuteronomy 32, verses 10 to 14, and then verse 18. Again, from the NIV, we read, beginning at verse 10, In a desert land he found him, in a barren and howling waste. He shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye. I think, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, but we need to go back and just read very briefly those verses in between, uh, verses 7 through 9 for continuity. Okay, so we're going to go back and read verses 7 to 9. We left off at 6, verse 7 then begins... Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you, your elders and they will tell you. When the Most High divided their inheritance to the nation, nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, the place of his inheritance. So what, what are those verses in between saying? It's basically saying, look, God, could, God uh, created the world. He divided the world among nations. Uh, he set the boundaries for the nations. And then his portion, his chosen people were Israel. And he divided the land that he gave to Israel. Now, we're going to pick up at verse 10 again, and verse 10 reads, In a desert land he found him, who's he talking about? He's talking about Israel. In a barren and howling waste, he shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye. Verse 11, Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, he hovers over its young uh, and hovers over its young that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. Verse 12. The Lord alone led him. No foreign God was with him. He made him ride on the heights of the land and fed him with the fruit of the fields. He nourished him with honey from the rock and with oil from the flint the crag, verse 14, with curds and milk from herds and flock, from herd and flock rather, and with fattened lambs and goats, with choice rams of Bashan and the finest kernels of wheat, you drank the foaming blood of the grape. And then skipping down to 18, you deserted the rock, 
who fathered you, you forgot the God who gave you birth. Okay, let's back up again to verse 10. It reads, In the desert land he found him in a barren and howling waste. He shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye. So again, the desert land is the hospitable, uh, inhospitable rather, land of wilderness. And before that, slavery. So he found him and the slavery brought him into this barren land, this howling waste, uh, this, uh, uh, this wilderness that he had again, their parents and then them to the point uh, that they uh, are now in uh, this wilderness. Now, he preserved them in this wilderness. We're going to see more about that in just a minute. He led them about. He instructed them, uh, the King James Version says. And then it says he, he guarded him as the apple of his eye. Now, we know, uh, those of you who've read uh, the Old Testament and certainly the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, which Moses wrote, know how God preserved uh, the, the children of, of Israel in the wilderness, how their their shoes didn't wear out, their clothes didn't wear out, how he provided water uh, in the wilderness from rocks, how he provided manna on occasion, quail, how he, he, he preserved them and protected them, certainly from uh, the initial uh, uh, attack or attempted attack by the Egyptians when they pursued after them and, and, and he allowed them to travel through the Red Sea. So, and it says he guarded them as the apple of his eye. And of course, the apple of the eye is the pupil. Uh, the pupil, of course, is necessary for sight and it is very sensitive and very very tender part of the body. It's protected by eyelids, by carnia, by eyelashes, and and it is something that uh, all of us take very, very uh, close care to protect. And God uh, pr provided the tender care for the nation Israel. Him, referred to here uh, in this verse, as the apple of his eye. Verse 11 says, like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young that spreads its wings to catch them. He carries them aloft. He is comparing his care for the nation Israel to how a mother eagle cares for its young. First of all, it stirs up the nest when the uh, young eaglets are too comfortable in the nest. Uh, they don't want to get out and start flying. Um, waiting on mom to continue to feed them. Uh, mom disturbs the nest and, and the way the nest is constructed is that it has uh, thorny, uh, it has thorns uh, around the perimeter and underneath that are covered over by grass and matting. Uh, however, when mother needs to get the eagles up and out, she starts removing some of that matting and exposing some of the thorns which makes it uncomfortable for the little eaglets to stay in the nest. And then it says she and the, the eagles actually begin to fly on the uh, on the backs of their mothers on the uh, between the wings as as, as you as you as you uh, of their mothers. And then they 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 flutter around and, and the mother is there to catch them if they're not able to begin to fly. And that's what this verse is saying. She hovers over its young. She spreads its wings to catch them uh, and carries them aloft. So she carries them until they're able to fly by themselves. And that is a good picture of what the Lord did for the nation Israel. Verse 12 says, The Lord alone led him no foreign God was with him. It was God, the Lord, again, all caps, Jehovah, the self-existent one, the only God, uh, living God, uh, no foreign God. And he, the reason for mentioning that is 
uh, by the when as the children of Israel sing this song, uh, they are going to be. Sorry about that. They are going to be worshiping idols. They're going to be contrib or uh, contributing their uh, blessings, such as they are, uh, to idols, to foreign gods, the gods of the foreigners they're going to be among. Uh, so he is reminding them that no foreign god, no idol uh, kept them uh, in the wilderness. It was he and he alone. Verse 13 he made him to ride on the heights of the land and fed him with the fruit of the fields. He nourished him with honey from the rock and with oil from the flinty crags. Now, he is talking about how he is going to bless them once they enter into the land of Canaan, once they go in to possess it. Uh, he's already referred in a number of places. Going back to Abraham, uh, described this land as a land flowing with milk and honey. But he goes to greater extent to to uh, explain how blessed they are going, to, how blessed they're going to be. Uh, ride on the heights of the land means they they will dwell in in high places, uh, safe from their enemies. Uh, from enemy invasions and of course we know the temple mount is a is a high place where they would offer worship to the true God and then he goes on to talk about the really the farmland and how fruitful it's going to be uh, he said and fed him uh, with the fruit of the fields uh, the, the fields are going to be uh, very productive farmland Again, Exodus uh, thirteen five describes it as uh, a land flowing with milk and honey. But again, he goes beyond that and says that uh, uh, he says he nourished him with honey from the rock and with oil from the flinty crag. What what, what is that all about? In other words, the, the land is going to be so bountiful uh, that even a rock, even the, the, what would be considered uh, uh, dry places or in, in a non-productive places are going to produce, they're going to produce. So all, honey from a rock means even the worst areas of the land are going to be very productive. And oil from flinty crag. So all the land is going to produce even in the worst areas. So it's going to be a very fruitful land that he uh, brings them into. So even in the inhospitable terrain, it's going to be very productive. Verse 14 reads, With curds and milk from herds, herd and flock, and with fattened lambs and goats, with choice rams of Bashan and the finest kernels of wheat, you drank the foaming blood of the grape. Now he's speaking in past tense. The song is written for their remembrance and much of this as they read this or remember this and sing this song from generation to generation will be in past tense because they will have come in and possessed the land and they will have uh, enjoyed the bounty that God provided for them yet being ungrateful, uh, displaying this ingratitude, and actually uh, committing abominations and worshiping and whoring after other gods. So in the NIV, it's called curds, but in the K KJV, it's called butter of kinds or butter of uh, the, uh, the herds, if you will, uh, milk of the sheep and fat of the lambs and rams, uh, of the breeds of Bashan, which are particularly fatted, fatted cows. It would, they had great grazing land in Bashan, and that's why the cows were so fat there. Uh, but he he goes on to to say that the the livestock is going to be very productive. Uh, they're going to be blessed. Uh, by the livestock as well as by the land. He, he comes back to the land uh, in speaking of 
how the wheat is going, how productive the crops are going to be, how productive uh, the kernels of fat, if you will, the kernels of wheat are going to be, and how uh, full of juice the, the grapes are going to be. So, so to sum these last couple of verses up, God is going to bless them abundantly uh, above their necessity, above those bare necessities. He is going to bless them abundantly uh, uh, through their, their crops uh, that are produced in the very productive fields and their livestock. Uh, they're going, he's going to make great provision for them beyond their bare sustenance he's going to bless them and he is saying this before again they enter the land and he wants them to contrast his blessings the blessings of keeping them bringing them out of a bondage keeping them in the wilderness bringing them into this bountiful land and blessing them with abundant provisions uh, with their unfaithfulness and we're going to read the few verses between uh, verses 14 and 18, verses 15, 16, and 17, again for uh, continuity, and then we'll finish up with a few comments on verse 18. So verse 15 says, But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked you, and kicked rather, you grew fat, you grew thick, you are ob obese. Then he forsook God who made him and scornfully esteemed the rock of his salvation. Verse 16, they provoked him to jealousy with foreign gods or idols. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. Verse 17 reads, they sacrificed to demons, not to God, to gods they did not know. To new gods, new arrivals that their fathers did not fear. Now this name Jeshurum actually is used sarcastically here. It actually means righteous. So God is calling them righteous, which they should be, and upright, but they're just the opposite. So he's using this sarcastically to describe Israel. Uh, and then he, he talks about what they, how they rejected him and how they, uh, they actually worshipped other gods, gods that uh, were foreign, gods that were no gods, gods that their, their ancestors did not know. So verse 18, we're moving to verse 18 then, we read, and actually, uh, let's read the whole verse, uh, A and B, I know this part, um, uh, just part B is part of our lesson, but uh, part A says, Of the rock that beget thee, thou art unmindful. The rock, the, the, the stable one that created you as a nation, you are, it says, unmindful, or you have forgotten. And then part B says, And has forgotten the God that formed thee. And this is a couplet. Basically, part B says, again, for emphasis, the same thing that part A says. It says, you have forgotten uh, the God that formed you. Uh, from the NIV, it says, you deserted the rock who gathered you. You forgot the God who gave you birth. And I apologize. It, that entire verse is part of our lesson text. You deserted the rock who fathered you and forgot the God who gave you birth. Now, that is like, well, it's, it's worse than us forgetting our parents altogether, not uh, just how much they did for us again in raising us and feeding us and clothing us and, and seeing that we were educated and, and teaching us and putting us on the, on the right path uh, uh, to, uh, and, and leading us to faith in the Lord. Uh, and, and, and all of that, it's, it's like we just forget that we ever had parents and we go doing uh, whatever seems right in our own eyes. And in the case of the ancient Israelites, that was whoring after other gods and attributing uh, their blessings to those gods. And it was an affront to God. And God later tells him how he is going to 
to judge them for their unfaithfulness, for their disregarding uh, his blessings and attributing them to other gods. So I hope we have gotten uh, uh, a little better understanding of this song of Moses. Again, the reason it was written was to contrast God's goodness, his faithfulness, his steadfastness, his immutability with the fickleness of the Israelites, with uh, their wickedness, with their pervertedness. Uh, and, and again, let's not just think this was for them. This was written for us today. Anytime we are ungrateful, uh, we are in danger of attributing something else, uh, uh, if, uh, our blessings rather, to something else or someone else other than God. Uh, Psalm 103 uh, tells us to forget not all of his benefits, and we do not want to do that. So, Father, we do thank and praise you again for this, uh, for this lesson, Lord. We pray that we've understood uh, not only uh, what you intended to teach the ancient Israelites through repetition and uh, uh, contrasting your goodness to their, uh, their fickleness and their perversion, but, Lord, help us to do the same. Lord, help us to be grateful, Lord. Help us to recognize to the extent we can all of your blessings, Lord, but to give you credit for every good and every perfect gift and to recognize that there are many seen and unseen blessings with which you bless us with every day. And we are certainly thankful for them. So we thank you again. Until such time as we meet again, Lord, we pray that you keep all those uh, in the sound of my voice and your loving care and every household represented in Jesus' name. Amen.